Is this the trumpets? So this is very traditional uh, Catholic church. Uh, you find these throughout northern New Mexico. Uh, you can see that everything's made with mud. So I bet you the community comes here once a year or once every other year and muds the walls of the entire church. Um, and this uh, you will find also throughout Taos in uh, the northern New Mexican communities. You can see all the soft lines. Nothing's exactly square except for maybe the doors, but <laughs> it's just rounded plaster. And some of this just done, done with bare hands. They get their, their hands in the mud and mix it with uh, straw. It creates a bond and uh, that's how these are made. Looks like they're getting ready to plaster it now. Huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's probably a need. And who are the traditional plasters, Leroy? The gente. Well, but of the gente, the women. The ladies, yeah. The yeah. ladies had the softer touch. Yeah. The men built it with with their hands and then the ladies did the final plaster. Well, St. Saint, Saint Francis de Assis and Taos, the uh -huh. famous church, yeah. They, they, it was the ladies' job to do that. They were called enjaradoras. Enjaradoras, uh-huh. So whenever you ask a woman to do your plastering, it's not a <laughs> euphemism. So this is a church that we're actually restoring inside and out. Uh, and this does have artifacts of my grandfather. If you guys want to learn more about this, we did a, a blog on our website, BlueRingGallery.com. It was an interview with uh, Victor Goler and uh, Nick Otero. And uh, very interesting. Uh, we'll post the episode on it. Cool. I don't think there's much we can do around here. No. <laughs> it's just nice to see history, man. Yeah, it is. It feels good. In the 50s, there was a priest at the Dixon Church and he was rebuilding an airplane, like a single engine airplane. And he put it in the, the engine in the living room. Like, I'm sure it was a little small, like almost like a lawnmower engine, right? And he was tuning it up and he mounted the propeller on it and was gonna run it to test it. But the propeller was too big and it started hitting the Vigas as it went around. I started smacking the Vigas with this metal tip propeller and putting these chalk marks in it. That is funny. Um, tell, tell the audience, too, what a Viga is. <laughs> we have all this northern New Mexico. A Viga is thing. a pine log that is like the, the roof the, the roof beam. Yeah. All these pine trees, they could be Vigas. That's exactly Because they grow straight and long. I have had a wonderful opportunity of following these trees and skinning them. Uh-huh. <laughs> like a draw knife? Yeah, uh-huh. That's hard work. <laughs> it is hard work. And how our ancestors did all this work is just amazing. It was like, psh, dedication, you know. It's still being done, too. Yeah. I've I've gone with friends and felt some Vigas as well. Yeah. And he told me if I ever need some for fixing my building, we just have to go out and get them. Yeah. <laughs> Especially the house you have. You have you're going to need some big Vigas in there. Yeah, that's true. I was asking my buddy, like, if he knew anyone I could buy a Viga from, and he's like, what do you mean? Uh, <laughs> go get like, it yourself. Well, I need some. He's like, no, let's just go get some. What do you mean? You don't need to buy any. That's how we, we think up here, right? Yeah. Uh, Self-efficiency. One of the um, other uses of the, the lumber up here was for the railroad ties. And we had one of our old timers, little friend Gonito, his grand, his dad was small like Gonito. Like Gonito was probably barely five feet tall. And he was in the lumber um, crew. And what they would do up here, they were cutting from up in these woods and they would dam up the embudo up here, which I think at this point is called the Rio Pueblo or the Rio Lucille. But they would cut some logs and block the river make a little reservoir and make a reservoir and then they would float these logs down that would become railroad ties and they'd let them back up and then they'd wait for the spring runoff when the water was going to be raging and there would be enough volume to take, them down. to take them all the way down to the Rio Grande and then they would end up in in Albuquerque to be milled to ties but one time they and normally what they would do is they would put dynamite at the base of the temporary dam and running a line out to the bank. And when they were ready to blow it, they would you know, just literally blow the dynamite, the dam would open and all the logs would go down. So 
that particular spring, Gonito was a little kid. He says he remembers like his dad coming home and telling his his mom this story about how when they went to blow the dynamite, it wouldn't blow. That I guess the charge didn't work. So because Gonito's dad was the smallest one on the crew, they tied a rope to him. <laughs> and he had to crawl out onto that dam. And they told him, right, you're going to have to light the charge by hand. And then we'll pull you back as quick as possible. <laughs> and he literally, like, he did that. And it worked. You know, it blows. All the logs go flowing down into, like, the- <laughs> through Penasco to Dixon and on to Albuquerque. That's funny. I think back then, too, uh, it was less populated and there was a lot more water in the the little acequias and the tributaries. Yeah. yeah, there's a photograph near shop where our house is now where it's so dry and the river's only five feet wide. Yeah. And it literally goes like from one side of the valley to the other, the water. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's full of railroad, or it's full of lumber too because they were floating the logs down at that time. So do you like fishing the embudo or do you I, like the Rio Grande? I prefer the embudo because I know it because it's right out our back door yeah um, and I walk it a lot in fact it was this spring's runoff was an inspiration for the painting bring it back around to the, the art um, so the painting of the gallery has now uh, healing waters so we had an exceptional runoff this year because the snowpack was amazing and just the force of that water. And now if we look at the Embudo, the Rio Embudo, it's- It's a trickle. It's a trickle. But at that point, there was bank to bank, just a, an amazing amount of water coming through there. And it was so forceful that like early in the summer when I waded into it, when normally it should have dropped by then, it was still strong enough that it was pushing me back, you know? And so Kristen had, had picked up this antique curved glass cabinet door and it kind of bulges out in the front. And, and I was thinking, well, that's the way that water made me feel if I was being pushed forward. And so I want this person in this painting to be pushed forward in that, that way. And uh, just the idea of like stepping into that water, it's so refreshing and it feels good. and Cold. Yeah. And the idea of healing waters. So then I'm, I'm kind of describing this composition to Sage. It's a, a man that has stepped into the river and the water's like, gushing around him and so that triggered the storyline tie-in in Sage's mind and then he came back later and explained it to me and it, it made that painting make sense within the storyline and I'll let go ahead Sage and tell the story about him or a little bit anyway yeah I'll, I'll give a little bit um, the man in the painting he's had a little bit of a rough life struggled with uh struggled with the hooch like so many so many people have and he developed that condition where you have a little bit of a limp and it's due to drinking wood alcohol so he's been living for years you know with a little bit of a limp and eventually he hears legend of these healing waters in a very specific place in a very secret area and so he decides you know what i I can't keep living like this either i'm going to go and those waters are going to heal me or they're going to take me away and I don't want to give away the ending, but <laughs> that's the premise of the story. Well, the other the other thing that reminds me, uh, Sage, is that throughout northern New Mexico, a lot, especially along the Rio Grande, are hot springs, and uh, the Pueblo peoples and and the Hispanic populations both considered those as spiritual sources. Um, in in and back to they would some of the uh, Christian churches would hold baptisms in there uh-huh. stuff. So, or the, the natives would go in there and do blessings and they're very spiritual uh, places. Um, now they're kind of run over by tourism and yeah, kind of disrespected. There's still a few hidden hidden springs people don't know about. Yeah. But we're not gonna go, we're not gonna drive to those today. No, no we won't take you. <laughs> uh, another clue about how special that spot is that he's standing on in the painting is the little trout that I have coming out of the frame. Mm-hmm. And uh, little indication that maybe I've been to that that healing hole a few times and pulled a few trout out of there. One of the other images that is already at the gallery, but it's the smallest one I did for this show, and it, it's him in the fox house. But actually, I think, well, it's hard for me to say this because every painting I finish, I'm like, that's my favorite one. Well, it's so cute and little. Um, but 
it started with that piece of, of architectural salvage that is the frame. It looks like a little house, and we never could figure out where it, what it actually was. But it compelled me to, to treat it like the fox's house. And so I wanted to fit a fox in there. And then Sage, as a tangential story within Fabulorico, has this story about the, a fox. And the, the traditional you know, thing is the fox in the hen house. Like the fox is in there ripping off the hens. But in this case, the house belongs to the fox. And he's brought a hen to his house. So it's the hen in the fox house. Sage, kind of, do you want to expound on how the fox arrived at the idea of kidnapping a hen? Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but this fox is extraordinarily intelligent to the point where he knows how to set traps that are left for him. He moves them and sets them somewhere else. And uh, instead of going and catching a chicken and eating it, the fox is smart enough to realize if I get this chicken and bring it back to my little fox house, then she'll be laying eggs every day instead. So instead of having one meal, this fox is smart enough to realize if I had just raised this chicken instead, then I'll have a meal every day. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost an Aesop's fable, uh -huh. but it's a fabulorico. You know what, maybe Aesop was actually a, a Nueve Mexicano. He probably was on his way over here. Yeah. Is that a, a Greek, right? Greek story? Yeah. Yeah. Aesop's fable. Oh, Jim, talk about the little uh, gremlin men. Oh, the gremlin men. <laughs> <laughs> the Duendes. Mm. Okay. So. Is it like Borf Duende? Yeah. So this is it. I haven't painted this yet, but Sage and I have talked about it a lot. A lot. And <laughs> so it didn't, a duende is kind of a Spanish version of a leprechaun or uh, elf. And they probably originated in Spain, but they actually, like the story of them and maybe them themselves live here in New Mexico now. And we'd heard stories about like duendes, people talk about the little people. And again, kind of along the storyline of, of the book Sage is writing is like, it's very dismissible. It's kind of like, oh, that person is just, you know, making up a story. But one day in our old studio, the old, that we're not in, but the older Adobe building we were in, um, these guys show up and they're, for lack of a better descriptor, they were bikers. Oh, look at the deer right there, lady. Oh, deer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So these guys were hardcore bikers. They weren't like weekend warriors. You know, these were your classic Northern New Mexican, you know, biker dudes. And uh, he was, we were talking about the art. He, he liked my paintings and, and then just kind of out of the blue, he goes, hey, you ever seen a Duende? And I'm like, no, that's silly. And he's like, no, man, I'm telling you, they're real because I seen one. And I was riding my bike. And when he says bike, he's talking about his Harley up above El Rito, up in the mountains on a forest road. And he sees this little person, like under three feet tall, little guy run across the road. And he was going so fast and it ran right in front of him that he couldn't stop. And he ended up laying his bike down like in the road and it slid into a tree, the, the fir tree that this little duende ran under and when he uh went to fish his bike out he found this little tiny shoe made out of bark so he figures that the duende you know in its haste it, its shoe fell off as it ran away <laughs> but for me that it's kind of like well this guy's got no reason to tell me that story you know like it doesn't make him seem more macho if he talks about seeing an elf mm -hmm. you know so maybe they are real so then Sage is incorporating that into this, the fiber of, of Fabulorico. And I will be fabricating that image. <laughs> Gotta get back so you can get back to work. That's right. Mm -hmm. There's painting to be done, yeah. And I won't ask you, Sage, to expound on the Duende story because we don't want to give anything away there. Yeah, I don't want to give anything away on them, but I will say that they do have a, 
a very strong influence over the course of the entire plot. Uh -huh. Leo, who were you, what were you thinking was a doing day? You were thinking somebody, you were telling me you, you know somebody that seems like they're a doing day. Who would that be? I think his name was what? <laughs> I am. I can be a duende. I didn't say that. <laughs> she did. No way. She goes, I think my dad's a duende. <laughs> the mischief part. Huh? Well, we had a, a few enanos in Taos, but I've never seen a duende. Uh, but that may not be true. I'm thinking when I was a little kid. Did you think you maybe saw one when you were a kid? No, I think there was a... Um, a a a duende that lived in Arroyo Seco, um, my, a friend to my grandma and grandpa. All right. When I was a little kid, and then he disappeared. I don't know what happened to him, but. Okay, now we're back at Jim's studio. I'd like to show you a few pieces he's working on. Of course, we've talked about a few uh, that are in the show, uh, but come on in. So uh, let's start with this piece. Okay. And you can, uh, we can talk about the frame too, because I think that's special. So what we have here is the haberdasher. And I was just compelled with this idea of like the door-to-door -door salesman, you know, the, the peddler that would come into a small place that maybe didn't have everything and he had everything on his back or on his wagon. And so I just wanted to create this, this character that was coming around, going door to door to make you these incredible offers, to quote Pee Wee. And uh, in doing the research for this, the word haberdasher had three meanings. And one of them, very common, is somebody that sells men's clothing, like hats. And I had drawn him where he has this stack of three hats on his head. So it's like, that's, that's one solid haberdasher. The next one was that he had sewing notions. He would sell ribbons, needles and threads, and thimbles. So if you look at the, his, his hand, we have the antique thimble that he would be peddling as well. And this is one of your wood carvings. Yeah, oh yeah, by the way, this isn't my hand. This is actually a piece of wood. <laughs> and then the third thing, which was a little quieter definition of a haberdasher, is he would secretly sell drinks particularly during Prohibition. And I had drawn him where he has this little pony keg on his back. And Sage and I and, and Krista were talking about it, the different things. It's like, oh, they sell, you know, like elixirs and medicines that fix you. And, and if you don't need the medicine, well, it's actually just a, a liquor. So how about a, a shot? You know, you can either get a <laughs> shot or a, a medication. And so it's just the fun of, of what can I load this guy down with? So you kind of see starting with the drawing and and just the different elements that he has and then it translates. I'm about two thirds of the way with the painting. Um, one of the characters that repeats is the cat. At this point, it just looks like a white cat because it's just blocked in, it's not finished. But if we look over here on the Wicked Wind, we'll see that Mr. Gatto makes an appearance here, right here in the corner, the cat on the hot tin roof. So he'll end up being a calico. So tell us about, well, before we go into this one, let's show us the frame for, okay. for this, and then we'll so come then talk about the wheels. With the, the environment, this guy, he's a door-to-door -door salesman, so he's reaching out his hands to say hello to you. I try to make you the sale, so I'll show you how this will work. Unscrew it from its base. And Part of the whole concept of this show is, is breaking that two-dimensional two plane of the painting and giving it a three-dimensional presence. So he's actually reaching out to shake your hand to make the sale. And the reason he's standing here doing this is because he's come to your door. So what better way to frame him than would be in a door? So he's kind of coming at you going, hey, nice to meet you. What do you need? I've got whatever it is that, that you're required. And then to drive the people in the gallery nuts, it's got sound. 
So this is an antique door that Kristen repainted, um, removed some of the panels so that we could put the paintings into What's it. What's going to do on that bottom panel? The bottom panel will be a smaller, I guess it's a diptych at this point. Mm -hmm. So it's a smaller image of the haberdasher's wagon loaded down with his lotions and potions. One of the things we love to do, Kristen and I working with our salvage stuff, is give Blue Rain Gallery the most difficult things <laughs> to put on the wall. <laughs> and we're like, how can we make it even harder? Well, let's make it round and it should spin. Right. Well, at least you're thinking of the uh, engineering part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, now this one. This one. This one. This is one of the major pieces for the show. Yeah, I wish we had a mirror so Leia could just look at it from up there. But this is a five foot in diameter antique um, pulley. So it would have been either in a barn or in a factory. And you can see there's a channel right here where the ropes would have spun it around. What I liked about it is that instead of a lot of spokes, it only had the four. So it divides it into quadrants. So I, I, I wanted to give myself the challenge of creating a round composition, but also had the opportunity to work in four quarters. So it, it made it easier for me to break it down into to its parts. But what wasn't easy is the perspective. There is no perspective, like there's no like normal perspective for me here. So it's all in a circle rather than it being, you know, like a vanishing. So what's, what's going on in this circle? So this is a, a dust devil. So the, the title is called the, the Wicked Wind. And this is, illustrating a portion of the story where this really powerful dust devil comes into this, this little um, ranchero, or ranchita. And the mom and the daughter had been sitting on the porch with the family dog that looks a lot like Toto from The Wizard <laughs> of Oz. They're sitting there and the mom was actually reading to the daughter from the Bible. So we've got the Bible flying through the air up here. But at that point, the, the wind's picking up and they realize it's a really big dust devil and the father's running to turn off the, the blades to the windmill. There's a, a break, and he wants to go over there and, and so stop it. Because otherwise, if it gets too windy, the windmill flies apart. But obviously, he's too late because it's, it's starting it's, to go. It's mm -hmm. going. And the uh, wind has come through the portal and picked the little girl up, and she's flying off. And you can see, like, her foot is actually breaking out of the plane of the painting. And she's, like, reaching down to her mom. Mama, help me. And... At the same time, the chickens that the are getting lifted up. And at that point, this falcon is like, well, that's easy pickings if there's a chicken in the air. And he's zooming down to grab the chicken. And the Bible is flying apart and the pages are being ripped out. And this page, hand carved by this hand, <laughs> gets caught on the frame and wraps around. And then you see that it's actually from an Old Testament book, Two Kings. Mm -hmm. Happens to be chapter 2, verse 11 which tells us about the time that a, a dust devil came and picked Jeremiah up and took him to heaven. So it was a really great tie into this whole scene. Um, there, there, aside from the calico, there's other things that tie in, like the little girl's stuffed animal mm -hmm. that flew off the porch with her. Well, it happens to be in our good friend, the haberdasher's pocket. <laughs> so a little this is maybe the, the pre-cell and the post-cell. Um, there's other elements that are going on. And like one of the things Sage pointed out to me, I'd like to take credit for this, but it, it's not me. It was serendipity. It's got the four elements, like the four archaic elements. Is that what it? Sure. Wind, it's water. Wind, water, land, and fire. Um, so you see the water spilling out of, of the, the water tank and it's about to put out the fire that's sparking from the wind that's coming out of the Orno oven. And of course the earth itself and the dust represents the earth. And the wind is the dust devil and the tumbleweeds. Um, super dynamic. Again, I, we like the challenge of giving Blue Rain something fun to work with. So as it sits on the wall, the wall will have this bracket that has the spindle on it. The piece will slide onto the spindle, be bolted in, so you can rotate the image slowly, no touching in the gallery, please. 
Yeah. <laughs> a gallery employee will show you how you can rotate the image. So there's actually no top or bottom. Like every, every piece of this painting is the top or the bottom. That's a wonderful idea. It's a great thought. <laughs> thank you. Behind it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank everybody for watching uh, Blue Rain Gallery podcast. I'd like to encourage you to subscribe um, to any of the platforms, or you can go to blueraingallery.com under the menu bar and press podcast. Uh, I'd like to also encourage you to bring art into your everyday life by visiting our online gallery store, blueraindprintshop.com. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you, Leroy. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yeah.